Hello there to all the people out there on the internet watching this production from the Royal Flying Doctor Service STAR program, Specialised Training in Aeromedical Retrieval. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is a favourite topic of mine and it's going to go for about a 30 minute uh, presentation and it will provide you uh, with a, a nice overview of the topic. The topic is uh, Psychiatric Aeromedical Retrieval Towards Best Practice. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Min Le Kong. I'm a uh, Royal Flying Doctor uh, in Queensland. I work at the Cairns base. I've been doing this for seven years now. I do half-time aeromedical retrieval and remote general practice as well as a half-time clinical education job for the uh, Flying Doctor Service of Queensland. My background is as a Royal GP. My fellowship training was in Royal General Practice with the Royal Australian College of General Practice. I have a dual fellowship with the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. I gained a diploma in aeromedical retrieval with the Otago University in New Zealand and have been active in research and clinical practice in aeromedical retrieval now uh, for uh, seven years. This topic is quite close to my own uh, uh, clinical interest uh, and essentially is going to cover a very broad overview of uh, the special transport group of people who have a acute mental illness, uh, but more so more broadly people who are acutely agitated. The objectives are to review current practices and literature, to provide uh, an overview of the assessment of uh, uh, mental health patients for transport, uh, to talk about physical restraint use, to talk about transport escort principles, uh, transport sedation principles and discuss a very controversial topic of uh, the use of intubation as a method of restraint for psychiatric retrieval. Where do I live and work? Uh, it's quite nicely illustrated on this graphic here by the Category 5 cyclone, Cyclone Yassi, which crossed pretty much over my house um, early this year in February. Uh, luckily it, um, it passed somewhat south of our um, of our city and uh, the, the damage wasn't as severe as expected. But uh, yeah, that's where I live and work up in uh, tropical North Queensland. So this topic is relevant in uh, for aeromedical providers uh, and I'll illustrate it with this real case. This happened only two years ago. It happened over British Columbia um, in a remote part of uh, northern Canada and uh, a young man uh, who was flying home um, after being seen at a hospital for acute agitation and suicidal ideation, managed to open the door of a King Air uh, twin-engine aircraft and jump out, and his body's never been recovered. Uh, that's the aircraft involved, and the graphic there shows the area of northern Canada where um, uh, this, the incident occurred. So why is this significant? Essentially, um, it highlights a, a point that uh, in aeromedical practice, we don't really have a really good uh, accepted international standard for how we should be assessing and managing people who are acutely agitated. This man, like I said, was assessed at the local hospital for uh, a, uh, an act of self-harm where he tried to cut himself with a knife. He was intoxicated at the time. He was felt to be safe for discharge and was actually sent out of the hospital um, to go home. His mother booked him a flight on a charter aircraft, which is the aircraft pictured, and then during the flight he became agitated once again and um, tried to open the door. Interestingly, he couldn't open the door, and it's due to this mechanism here. RFDS pilots uh, tell me quite reliably, because uh, we use the same aircraft as that what was pictured, that during full pressurisation of the cabin, the uh, the air stair door, the main access door, is, is, is incredibly hard to open because it has a pressure assisted locking device. Um, so during altitude and full uh, pressurisation of the cabin, uh, the door is uh, essentially made unable to be opened. So the question remains, how did this young man able to open the door when it was fully pressurised? Believe it or not, um, we're talking to my RFDS pilots about this, but what, what's fairly common in pilot training is this belief that if you depressurise the cabin, uh, the altitude-induced hypoxia will render an agitated person uh, submissive um, and essentially um, unconscious. 
So the pilot in this case actually did do this. It uh, didn't work and within 10 seconds of depressurization the man was able to open the door and jump out. So I guess this illustrates the fact that we don't really have a good, a well-researched approach to how we might manage uh, acutely agitated people before flight, but let alone during flight. And my pilots often refer to the, their concerns of acute agitation and, and uh, that may be due to a mental illness, that, that these, these patients that we transport are considered a dangerous good and therefore uh, we need to be very careful about this. Um, and here's a picture of Hannibal Lecter from, um, from the famous movie Silence of the Lambs. And, and the question remains is what is the best method to you know, uh, safely move someone who's acutely agitated uh, in, during transport, let alone air transport? Well, a survey on a fairly popular aeromedical uh, website called FlightWeb, this was done uh, only last year, shows that about a third of respondents out of 209 respondents still felt that chemical paralysis intubation as a method of restraint was quite appropriate for severely combative patients. Is there an alternative? I think, I think uh, we're going to highlight that there possibly may be. Uh, that's the aircraft that the Royal Flying Doctor Service of Queensland section flies. It's a twin engine aircraft. That's the inside of the aircraft. Uh, as you can see, not much space there between the patient stretcher and the, and the front of the cabin. The statistics for my service are, are, are fairly um, salient in that we do, uh, this is a fairly common uh, transport uh, group that we do move. So on average, we'd move 10 to 15 mental health diagnosis patients per month. Other states of Australia, for example, Central Section or South Australia, they move uh, almost double this amount. Um, and what I would think is still fairly common around the world in Australia is that current aeromedical practice for this group of uh, psychiatric patients or agitated patients is, is, is pretty much ad hoc assessments. Guidelines, if they are there, are often ignored. There's often uh, a lack of use of police escorts and physical restraints. Um, and certainly in Australia, um, uh, when I first started flying doctor service and aeromedical work um, and to this day there is still a fairly low threshold for intubation as a method of restraint uh, and what I call a must transport mentality and what I mean by this is that when uh, a job is given to move uh, an acutely agitated patient there's often a feeling that we uh, we just have to go and do it and to do whatever we need to to do it um, the government has been looking into the area of uh, safe transport for mental health patients. This was a publication produced by a 2004 uh, Minister of Health um, Committee. And in that uh, document, in Table 4, the safe transport of people experiencing mental disorders was highlighted. And these are some of the objectives that they felt were important. That's consumers should be safe during transport, but also transport staff should be safe. Known problem areas included heavy sedation that required intubation, police being asked to move clients without support of clinical staff, and adverse events related to restraints and sedation. What does the literature look at this? There's a very good paper by um, Dr. Jones from the US Air Force that really highlights this and I'd recommend it. And essentially what he said in his paper that Aeromedical transport of psychiatric patients didn't occur till the latter part of the Second World War. Essentially, before that, it was mainly done by maritime vessels. Um, but they found that this was a problematic, that long uh, sea journeys on vessels for acutely uh, mentally unwell uh, soldiers could actually make things worse. And there were a number of uh, suicides reported where people, uh, soldiers would be jumping off of a vessel um, into the ocean uh, in a suicidal act. So the US Air Force was tasked with trying to find a way, particularly during the Pacific campaign where there were a lot of combat stress casualties, they were tasked with a way of trying to move uh, acutely uh, unwell psychiatric patients uh, back to uh, other countries so they could be properly cared for. So they, they formed this system which essentially is still operational today. It's a classification system where they classify acutely agitated psychiatric patients into high to low risk. And depending on the level of risk, 
um, they, they, they respond with a level of uh, appropriate management. And this can range from um, uh, absolutely no response to a full response, which include physical and chemical restraints, as well as a dedicated same-sex escort. Um, the paper here by Peterson and Baker uh, it was published two years ago and it, it, it highlights, it pretty much illustrates the same approach that was adopted in World War II by the US Air Force is still quite applicable and still actively used uh, even during the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Dr Wheeler and Dr Wong of um, the British Columbian uh, Emergency Medicine um, community have published this paper about their ambulance program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and in their paper, they, they list a number of uh, indications they use with for sedation. Um, and they provide some general recommendations where they, they provide, you know, uh, the recommendation that one hour prior to departure, three sedating agents are given intramuscularly. So this is just one method. It's not the method that we use in the Flying Doctor Service of Queensland, but obviously this is the published literature that's out there. And, and frankly, there isn't much literature out there. During their paper, quite saliently, they recommend that their flight paramedics are given the authority to leave a patient if they felt they weren't adequately prepared. So the big deal is, if at all, how can we predict if someone is going to become aggressive and violent in flight and how do we handle it if it does occur? The greatest risk factors for violence uh, are in this paper published in the Archive of General Psychiatry include things such as acute substance abuse and environmental stress or and a history of violence. And probably of all those, I would say a history of violence is the thing that we've found the most predictive. Uh, we have been using a risk assessment tool in the uh, aeromedical section here in Queensland. This is its latest version. I was involved in the writing party for this. And essentially, it's trying to give an idea to the assessing person of what key things might predict a higher than average risk of um, aggression and violence. Probably the one that we found the most significant is this one, where multiple expressions of anger and frustration that require some kind of additional management is, is, is generally a pretty good predictor of future episodes of agitation and, and aggression. Once we um, uh, assign a level of risk, we assign a level of risk management. So very similar to the US Air Force approach. So here I've highlighted the high risk management where we have a flight nurse, a medical officer, uh, intravenous access, the patient is sedated and physically restrained. Um, some form of physical security is recommended um, and an adequate trial of pre-flight sedation is, is advised before any consideration of intubation. So things to remember that are often forgotten is that um, easily reversible causes of agitation, um, such as hunger, thirst, these are two issues which can be problematic, particularly if you're giving sedation, uh, obviously because it can you know, cause an increased risk of um, regurgitation and vomiting if you have someone with a full stomach. Um, pain obviously is something we should try to address. A full bladder can be easily treated. Um, but the other thing we find increasingly is the, the role of nicotine uh, and nicotine withdrawal in sudden unexplained agitation during an aeromedical transport. Um, this paper by Allen, uh, published earlier this year in the uh, American Journal of Psychiatry, um, uh, you know, show that if you do choose to treat um, nicotine withdrawal, it can actually improve uh, people's uh, agitation and reduce the need for sedation. So in, in their paper, they randomise uh, nicotine patch therapy to placebo and along with normal sedation in this um, psychiatric ward. What they found is that about a third less people at four hours uh, required, uh, you know, were noted to be less agitated and required less sedation. And in aeromedical practice in RFDS Queensland, we've noted this, we are, uh, uh, um, are currently undergoing a, an ethics proposal to look at a randomised trial in the aeromedical environment. But in, in practical application, we have been doing this and we found it actually has anecdotally seemed to reduce people's requirements for sedation. Um, so nicotine replacement for agitation on aeromedical retrieval is, 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 a, is a proper study that's worthy. 
it's simple therapy, it's biologically plausible. Um, let's get on to physical restraints. Now, um, uh, talking to senior nurses and pilots, they do remember a time when straitjackets were used. Um, so why don't we still use this? I guess the, the viewer should consider why not, but um, in general there's a whole range of ethical issues about practical issues of restraint in terms of, you know, if there is an aircraft emergency or an accident and, and somehow um, uh, the escorts are rendered incapable of, of providing care for the patient. If they're in a straitjacket, um, then, then, you know, it's obviously going to be impossible for them to try to care for themselves. Um, it's, it's not a, you know, a, a black and white issue there because obviously um, there needs to be a compromise between the restraint providing some degree of security but also not but providing a complete lack of movement of the patient and their ability to, to care for themselves in an emergency. Um, so so that, there's some of the issues around, around that. What do we use here in Queensland? We have a four-point restraint. There's a picture here of, of someone in the four-point restraints. They have an additional body belt with, with a handcuff provided by the Queensland police there. Um, South Australia um, RFDS has a body net, which I'll show you in a sec. Uh, at the end of the day, restraint should be used with careful medical monitoring. Uh, you should never restrain someone on their stomach because that reduces their ability to breathe. And certainly you should never let someone struggle against restraints because there's a number of reported deaths of people struggling against uh, their restraints, developing lactic acidosis and sudden death, what they call the excited delirium syndrome reported in the emergency medicine literature from North America. Here's another graphic of a police escort with a pilot. Uh, this is a, a patient here who's got the four-point restraints. You can see around their ankles and their wrists, um, and he's on, a, he's on an infusion of a sedative there that I'll explain in a minute. This is um, a, a volunteer who's demonstrating a body net that's used in uh, RFDS central section. So. Yeah, not, not every uh, RFDS section or aeromedic provider uses the same restraint and, and I think we need to have some safe principles how we should use it. So uh, the ability to release them quickly, the ability for them not to restrict breathing, etc, etc. Uh, who, who is the right crew and escort to go with acutely agitated people? Uh, frankly, I don't think it really matters as long as there's two trained providers. Preferably, you know, in my service we use a doctor who's got, I think they should have some experience in acute mental health, whether that be done in an emergency department setting or in a formal psychiatric ward setting. They should have advanced airway skills and be trained in procedural sedation. Uh, in our, in our uh, service we have a flight nurse who uh, is, is similarly trained. But, you know, you could have two flight nurses, you could have two flight paramedics. Um, as long as there's two people to attend to the person's sedation needs and, and their airway management. Uh, in South Australia, they use a paramedic model, uh, but, but I think everyone on board should have advanced resuscitation training. Uh, and what's the role of police in this work? Uh, police escorts, I think, are it's, it's controversial. In all states of, South, in all states of Australia, uh, the mental health acts in each state allow for the request of police for transport escorts. Uh, they have, in my view, a very important role. I think they have legal powers of detention, whereas most other security elements do not. They are obviously trained in restraint, and, and my experience is that they often have a deterrent effect. This is a double-edged sword. Some, some of my colleagues would argue that they may exacerbate agitation. I have never experienced that, but some colleagues have. Um, I, I have a graphic here of the X26 taser device. This is carried by all police forces in Australia. Uh, it's interesting to note that some police escorts have tried to take uh, the device on board the aircraft. This is uh, restricted due to the fact that it's actually an explosive device uh, under the uh, aviation regulation. Um, so, so it's interesting. I mean, uh, we, we, uh, people have different ideas how they're going to provide non-lethal restraint. Uh, but obviously we, we want to try to pr provide it in a um, uh, safe and, and uh, um, a standard manner so that, that everyone um, feels that uh, we're doing best practice. Let's illustrate this with a case. 
Mr T is a real case. He is a 24-year-old Indigenous Australian man. He was admitted to a rural hospital in um, remote Australia with deteriorating behaviour and self-care. His history is of schizophrenia. Um, the request comes from our central coordination service and essentially the coordinator who's an emergency physician uh, uh, advised Look, it's your decision as the as the retrieval doctor that I'd intubate this guy. He was moved last time on a ketamine infusion by, by one of the flying doctors, but I think it's probably best just to intubate him. On further history, he's, like I said, in a rural hospital with a general practitioner or a family physician. He's under an involuntary treatment order. It's 4 p.m. Uh, it's a, sh a relatively short flight, but it's getting close to dark, and this may play an issue because some of our pilots... Um, get quite anxious during da uh, uh, night operations. And essentially his treatment at this point has been uh, a lot of sedation, so uh, a generous dose of benzodiazepines and antipsychotics. And when our retrieval team gets there, the patient's in the doorway yelling, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, there's two police in attendance, with, uh, he has intravenous access. And the situation is often um, uh, compared to this. Essentially, you're being confronted with a very dangerous, volatile uh, situation where there's a great potential for harm. It's not quite sure what to do with it. And there's a, there's a sense of primeval fear where um, uh, we need to recognise that fear is very common and a natural response in these situations like this. And we do need to consider it because when, when we're afraid, we can make irrational decisions or not as well considered decisions as we would if we weren't afraid. So for example, zero tolerance approaches can be adopted and, and this is not necessarily the best thing for, for uh, not only the patient but, but also the, uh, the retrieval team. There are limits of benzodiazepine and antipsychotic sedation. Um, this is well known and described. Uh, substance abusers are often tolerant to first line sedatives. Certainly chronic alcohol abusers are often tolerant to very much everything, even including general anaesthetics. And at some point you need to decide where to, where to proceed, uh, either procedural sedation or deeper sedation or general anaesthesia. Uh, ketamine sedation is something that we have been uh, researching and implementing in our retrieval practice. As many of you would know out there, it's a powerful sedative, it maintains respiratory drive, it works on the... NMDA receptor pathway uh, as opposed to the GABA pathway of benzodiazepines. There is literature out there. This Israeli paper published um, in 2007 uh, uh, describes a protocol for ketamine and midazolam sedation in combative uh, multi-trauma patients from the front line. And there's, there's, there's a few pre-hospital reports from North America of, of um, uh, EMS physicians and paramedics uh, using ketamine um, to get control of acute agitation. Um, believe it or not, uh, ketamine has been studied as an antidepressant, a rapidly, anti, uh, rapidly acting antidepressant. And this is, um, the main work has been through Dr. Zarati from the Yale University who's been studying this. And they've noted quite a robust and rapid antidepressant effect after a single dose of intravenous ketamine. This was published in the Nature Journal last year and tries to describe a mammalia, um, a mice study done where it tries to explain why NMDA receptor antagonists such as ketamine can reduce, uh, can rapidly reduce suicidality and depressive symptoms. Uh, myself and my colleagues, Dr. Ginther and Hunter and Dr. Schuller, um, have uh, published a paper on this in our own experience, and I'd recommend you look up the paper and, and read our findings. Um, we have a very now formal process for sedation. We do a handover, an airway assessment, preparation of resuscitation gear, setting up and monitoring, uh, a careful medical assessment and fasting status, uh, targeting a sedation score and a target sedation level. Um, and we use the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale and we target deliberately that range of the sedation scale. Um, that's part of our protocol, not the complete protocol, but it gives you a sample of, of what kind of 
agents we have uh, available there, but um, the other part of the protocol that's not shown in this graphic is the use of ketamine intramuscularly and intravenously. Let's uh, get on to the role of intubation. Is this necessary? If so, what psychiatric measure warrants this? Uh, I have a graphic there of, uh, of uh, sorry, a photograph there of, of, a, of a patient that I moved from a remote island who had stabbed herself with a kitchen knife. It's uh, pictured there. And essentially, um, um, the issue is, is uh, and, and clearly, obviously, she was intubated and ventilated, but clearly she had a medical and a surgical reason to have airway and ventilatory control. Um, but in someone who's not, the decision is not so clear. I think it has to be a medical decision. I don't think we should ever uh, uh, have it. Uh, kind of in the situation where pilots might be saying, well, I'm only going to move this patient if you intubate them. It's, it's got to be a medical decision because ultimately medical safety is, lies with the, uh, the person providing the anaesthetic. Uh, we know from the trauma literature that if people get intubated purely for combativeness, they do worse, longer lengths of stay, increased pneumonia. Um, the statistics from our service is that we uh, intubate in the last, in those years, 2000, 2009, about you know, seven to, to, uh, seven to 11 patients a year. Since we've been doing ketamine sedation, I know that that figure has dropped and, and hopefully I'll publish those figures uh, in a journal uh, soon. The question to me is how far are you prepared to go? Once you decide that intubation is the only way to restrain this patient, clearly one of the possible complications will be the requirement for a surgical airway. And we really need to consider this. Is this something that we really want to proceed down? The National Association of EMS Physicians of North America have published a paper on this in 2002. Their position is that generally standard sedatives are the most frequently used and the most appropriate. And in, in their position paper there, they clearly say that intubation with paralysis should never be used solely for the purpose of restraining violent behaviour. However, I, I, I think there is a role. Um, so whilst it might sound that I'm contradicting myself, I think that uh, there has to be a balance of approaches. I think that um, there are times when it is appropriate to intubate patients, but I think they should be the exception. Uh, these are some of the things that I decide for myself what are uh, uh, decisions uh, to do the intubation. I, I think probably of all of them, the most important is an intoxicated state. Um, obviously, if you have you know, a situation where your sedation is failing, then clearly you should proceed with uh, uh, definitive airway control and, and, um, and much deeper sedation or general anaesthesia. So if you decide to intubate, uh, these are some of the complications we, we know do occur. Uh, finding out a receiving facility or department to accept an intubated psychiatric patient is very important. We've had situations where um, uh, because there was no pre-agreement, uh, emergency departments or even ICUs have refused to accept an intubated mental health patient because they do not have a critical care illness. And, and even um, suggestions of extubating uh, in the ambulance or extubating in the ED corridor have been made, which in my view are quite inappropriate. Extubation is a high-risk procedure. It is, it is uh, one of the highest-risk episodes during a whole anaesthetic where someone is most likely to aspirate and, and, and develop uh, aspiration complications. Um, certainly what I tend to do is once I've intubated, I don't use paralysis. I think sedation is very important. And it's basically, we've had two uh, situations where patients that we have intubated for transport for mental health reasons have actually uh, come back and, and provided um, uh, the comment or, or complaint that they were aware during the whole procedure and as well as the transport. Um, so awareness during RSI and general anaesthesia is a well-recognised complication and, um, and, and we've had two reported cases of that for, for this indication of a mental health patient being restrained uh, using intubation and ventilation. So I think it's important that if you don't paralyse them you at least get some indicator of their level of sedation and if it's clearly inadequate we, we should be providing deeper sedation. 
Uh, use a short-acting sedative, propofol, I think is quite reasonable if you have good airway control. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't want to do any harm. Whether you intubate them or do sedation, um, whatever we do, we, we, we should really provide the least restrictive and the least risky means of, of management. So remember, Mr T, the decision, um, I wasn't uh, uh, on the actual retrieval, but uh, I was on call as an aeromedical consultant. The re registrar who attended rang me up and, and, and got some advice. In the end, we decided to proceed with RSCI. The preparations were made. Um, further consultation. Um, I, I decided in the end that, look, um, if the guy's very combative, give him a test dose of ketamine. And if it works well, I guess you can wait and see and give further boluses if you're happy to do that. But if it doesn't work, and uh, you can consider the, the intravenous ketamine dose as a form of pre pre um, pre-medication for your RSI. So he gave a 70 milligram bolus, it's, it's a lowish dose, um, and he said that the person dissociated very nicely, excellent dissociative sedation was achieved. He was transported in uh, RFDS restraints and a further dose of um, ketamine was given. So look, in summary, um, what I wanted to highlight is that the current air transport of psychiatric patients lacks some consistency. When you look at the lack of literature, the lack of published guidelines, etc. Uh, in my view, the proper transport preparation and planning stems from an adequate assessment during the planning and handover phases of, of the psychiatric patient uh, who is uh, planned for aeromedical transport. The literature would suggest that with an appropriate escort, chemical and physical restraint, uh, that this is often the, uh, the, the, the most successful and adequate uh, form of management. And in my view, the resort to intubation for higher risk transport should be the exception rather than the accepted practice. I hope I've given you something to think about and I hope you've motivated you to consider some research in this area. I have provided uh, one, uh, one example of what I think is a model for better practice. I wouldn't say it's the best practice, but I think it's, it's certainly since I've been doing it, I think it's a better way of doing it. I think uh, for further details uh, about the RFTS STAR program, here are the contact details, and please send us an email, uh, let us know what you think, let us know what other topics you'd like to hear on, um, on the YouTube channel and so forth. So thank you very much, and I hope you all have enjoyed it.